So welcome everybody to the April 2021 meeting of NHS Northamptonshire CCG. Um, so um, I'd like to welcome everybody here um, and um, I'm just going to share a few apologies. So um, we have apologies from Philip uh, from Mitten. Um, we uh, are expecting that um, Bev may be a little late and uh, Pope may need to dive out of the meeting at various points. Is anyone else aware of any apologies? And if I could ask, who is the, do we have the director on call present in the meeting today? So we have the director on call, that's perfect, lovely. So um, if anybody could mention uh, if there are any declarations of interest relating to items um, on the agenda, are there any declarations of interest? OK, I can't see any of those. Thank you. Uh, I am going to use the numbers on the pack for the purposes of the meeting. There are uh, some minor changes with that, which I will mention as we come to those. Um, but I'm going to use the meet numbers on the pack uh, just for clarity as we go through. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do was to um, uh, go through the minutes of the meeting from February. I'm uh, going to go through for accuracy and then for matters arising. So if we start with page four. Page five. Six, seven, eight, page nine, ten, eleven, twelve, page thirteen, fourteen, and I think that's the final page. Is everybody happy that those are a true and accurate representation of the meeting that took place last time? And can anyone see any matters arising uh, that are uh, not on the um, agenda today? OK, uh, so there are two items that are on the action log. Uh, the first one, there is a minor amendment to the uh, next um, uh, the Quality, Safety and Performance Committee is actually uh, in June. So that is still outstanding. Um, and because the committee date has changed, the action date needs to change to June. Um, and then the other one, um, uh, item um, 201121, which is out of the same minute um, is green. So I'm going to move on to the um, uh, next item on the agenda. Let me just bear with me two seconds. OK, so the uh, next item on the agenda is the chair and chief executives report. Um, I have one minor amendment which I'm going to add to this one before handing over to Toby for anything that he particularly wants to draw attention to. Um, I think with this one, I'm, I'm pleased that we're, we're moving in the right direction. I think the one thing that is even better than this report is um, mentioned was the learning disabilities health check and where we have been pessimistic. We are um, optimistic that those numbers are actually likely to be better than the numbers that are recorded um, and we will be reporting those at the next uh, governing body meeting. Uh, but it looks like we will be achieving our learning disability health check uh, numbers, which I'm, I'm absolutely delighted about. Um, Toby, is there anything you particularly want to draw people's um, attention to? Thanks, Chair. Um, you've drawn attention to the first that I was going to as well. Um, and it is significant actually just pausing on that for a moment, because in terms of one of our most kind of vulnerable um, population cohorts across the county, it's an area that for many years we've struggled as a county to be able to deliver the level we would need to and the, the progress that's been made this year in spite of all of the challenges of doing that in the midst of a global pandemic and COVID I think is something that I'd be keen as you say Joe for us just to come back and recognise and understand where the final position ended up there as well notwithstanding that there's always further progress and more to do in these areas so I was going to point to that in particular from the paper happy to take the rest of the paper as it's as it's written and read and any comments from colleagues just want to just put one bit in up front though in terms of context for today's meeting I just wanted to put on records my recognition of how hard everyone across the organization is working at the moment wider system yes of course but this is a CCG conversation this afternoon um, and I mean that both in terms of our clinical leads our lay members and also our exec teams and staff um, because, because this kind of feels like five really big agendas that we're juggling at the moment and they'll come through again as we go through today's agenda the continued response to COVID, particularly in terms of vaccination programme and rollout. I mean, we'll touch on this later on, but just tremendous place to have got to. But significant number of our staff still heavily embedded, particularly from a primary care perspective and our PCNs and clinical leads in the VAX programme. 
Secondly, we'll touch today in terms of planning round and the huge amount of focus and energy going into the first six months, what we kind of call half one now of 2021, alongside the big agenda around integrated care system development. And I know we're going to touch more on this in our kind of private part of today's meeting, but we'll come back in future public meetings, of course, to talk more about that transition through to next year as well as um, particularly Stuart and finance colleagues managing year end closed down positions in terms of financial accounts, all of which are happening this year at the same time as operational planning rounds, because we've moved that further back into the year. And then last but absolutely not least, the kind of continued focus on the work that teams like Angie's team do around quality and safety in terms of those ongoing issues we have across the county, um, where we're always kind of advocating and looking out for the safety and quality of services for our patients. And I really put that down chair and board just at the start of the meeting because it, it illustrates the breadth of work that we are engaged with, still in very unusual and different circumstances with most of our staff still working from home, which is absolutely appropriate. Um, and that kind of balancing of those agendas in everything that we're doing. So I just want a bit of an opening on the record, really, from me to say I know how hard everyone's working on multiple different things that are spinning at the moment. Um, and we'll get a good sense of that chair as we go through the course of, of today's board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, absolutely. And, and, and I'd very much like to add my thanks and I'm sure on behalf of the governing body as well for everybody throughout the organisation. Um, Ali, um, uh, would you like to comment? just want to build on what you've just said about system working and the annual health check. So as of this week, we are 79% in terms of delivery and that's a consequence of primary care, LMC, NHFT, finance colleagues, internal commissioning, a real example of integrated working. So I just, it builds on what you've just described, Toby, uh, with the varying priorities. Um, so that and obviously we're moving to year end. So that's a fantastic achievement and from a quality perspective. So I just felt I'd give a current position um, as the figures have um, been consolidated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments on the um, chairs or on chief execs report? OK. Um, we have had a, a, a certain amount of correspondence, but we've not had any questions from members of the public. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to remind those who wish to ask questions that they do need to be related to items uh, that are on the agenda. Um, we're going to move on to item uh, eight on the agenda, uh, which is the update on the uh, COVID-19 uh, incident, which is uh, still ongoing. Um, I'm going to hand over to um, Lucy for the first part of that, and I believe Sarah for the second part. Um, over to you, Lucy. Thank you, Chair. So just a quick update on the kind of main position uh, for the county. Well, nationally, um, we've obviously had a good news story. We've seen case rates and positivity come down. And as of this morning, the national case rate was 26.8 cases per 100,000 as a rolling seven day average for all age groups. And positivity was at 1.1% and again, still continuing to come down. In the East Midlands, there is a slightly more complex picture. We have got some significant areas of enduring transmission in areas like Leicester City, Nottingham City and indeed Corby. Um, so we have seen um, a higher than England average as a region. Um, but within the new Western North Northamptonshire councils, we have West Northamptonshire on 39.7 um, as a case rate for all ages as a rolling seven day average and positivity of 1.5%. Um, North Northamptonshire still continues to be slightly skewed by the higher rates in Corby at 51.1 as a case rate and 2% positivity, but both continue on a downward trajectory, which is really, really positive. Indeed, if we looked at Corby as a, a, a sort of a separate area, as we had obviously been reporting until the end of March, when we obviously hit the new unitary um, arrangements, Corby would now be around seventh on the chief medical officer's watch list. So very much further down that um, um, areas of concern than it had been and again as I said it continues to, to make progress that's really positive. We've got a number of symptomatic and asymptomatic testing sites which continue to obviously be operational and are covering a wide variety of hours so that people can attend before and after work even if they're working shift work. 
And we obviously now are supporting the click and collect arrangements for lateral flow device testing at home, where you can pick up tests from those test sites, but also from a number of pharmacies across the county. So very much now trying to embed this as business as usual. But as, as you've said and, and, and Toby has reflected on, we, um, we do still have a lot of resource in the initial response. And I anticipate that, that certainly for public health will continue for some time. But broadly good progress, we obviously just have to encourage people to continue to adhere by all the rules so that we can continue to compress out of lockdown. OK, thank you. Um, so um, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the vaccination item next um, and then um, to open the, the floor for questions related to the COVID response. I believe Toby's doing the vaccination update. Over to you, Toby. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'll step in and pick up on, on vaccinations. Um, the agenda reflects the fact that obviously Sarah was leading on this for us from a system point of view until relatively recently, having been kind of repurposed back to work on some of our ICS work as well. Um, but obviously I continue to be close to this, um, particularly with Chris Palo working as our system lead on the vaccination program at director level working into me at the moment. So yeah, pleased to be able today to kind of continue to report good progress from an overall vaccination program in terms of rollout. Just looking at today's latest kind of daily numbers in front of me, we kind of 445,000 jabs delivered across the county to date through the whole of this period. Um, 347,000 or so of those first doses. And we've really seen in the last few weeks the number of second doses coming through significantly as people are reaching that kind of 12 week mark. We're now um, just, you know, 97, 98,000 sort of number in terms of our population who have been second dose and received as well across the county, which is obviously tremendous. Um, we've got all of the different um, vaccination delivery points up and running still across the county. Um, so the large vaccination centre at Moulton Park, just opposite our normal CCG headquarters here, um, continues to be one of our most significant by volume in terms of delivery points um, and has been doing kind of the best part of 1,700, 1,800 jabs a day um, at the moment over the last period, um, with just over the majority of those being seconds. But we've seen a real step up again over the last couple of weeks, particularly last Last week um, with the Moderna vaccine um, having come through now and being one of the, the first three sites in the Midlands region to um, be able to be delivering the Moderna vaccine, which is, is great news um, and a good I think, reflection and testament to um, the quality and work of our programme team locally in all its different forms. We've also continued to have our um, GP-led vaccination um, centres um, operational. Most of those focused until recently around the second dose side of things, reflecting where we've been in terms of constraints on supply, um, in terms of first dose vaccine. But now we've seen the age cohort opened up in terms of cohort 10 with the 45 to 49 year olds. Um, that alongside with Moderna coming into the counties, seen our activity levels stepping back up again. And we've also got the hospital hubs at Kettering and Northampton primarily operating on second dose model for those um, members of our population and for some staff as well who were first dosed through those hospital hub sites, particularly around the kind of December, January period when they were most operational. Um, a lot of work also continuing across um, the teams focused on making sure that uptake levels are as high as we can get them across all the cohorts. Um, I've said on this call before, but you know, one of my anxieties here is as we progress down through the age cohorts in particular, what look like small percentages of the different age cohorts in the first priority areas, particularly some of our more elderly population and also others with other underlying conditions. What look like small percentages actually still reflect quite reasonable numbers of people within our county that we'd still like to reach out to. So that kind of ask through any public messaging opportunities we've got about reinforcing that if you're an eligible group, please do come forward, please go onto the national booking system, please do get yourself registered or contact your practice. Um, and also we continue to do work with particular communities that we know um, for various reasons have had more kind of questions um, that they wanted to work through, um, at both from a, an ethnic perspective, but also from a geographic coverage point of view as well. And a real focus in the kind of Corby part of the patch, given what Lucy was touching on there in terms of some of those community case numbers as well. So continues to be a massive effort. And I guess we need to remember here as we go through the summer that although it feels in many respects that we've got over some of the early big priority focus of the VAX programme, the numbers just get bigger when you go down the population kind of pyramid. And so actually the amount of our staff, both in primary care and other services that are going to continue to be heavily involved in this over the summer months is going to be huge, um, even though thankfully we've managed to reach out to most of our most vulnerable population already. 
So happy to take any comments, Joe, or questions from colleagues on that. Thank you. Um, any comments or questions from anyone? Lucy, you got in first. <laughs> So just a very quick one to say that um, public health have been supporting the vaccination programme as well to make sure that we're identifying where there are inequalities in uptake of the vaccination. We also have talked this morning about the fact that we're starting to understand some hesitancy because of recent reporting around risk. So we are also looking at making sure that we address some of those underlying concerns and make sure that there is really clear communication about the extraordinarily low risk that is associated with any of the vaccinations. Um, obviously key to us progressing in the way that we have out of lockdown is making sure that we do have good uptake across all um, of our different groups across the communities. So we will continue to support that. Thank you, Lucy. Ange? Yeah, I just, just building on what Lucy said in terms of um, some, of the, some of the inequalities, we've seen that, Lucy, with some of our social care staff in care homes who've been reluctant to take up the vaccine. So Lucy's just covered that, but obviously that's something via the care home cell that we're trying to tackle in terms of briefing and calling care homes and supporting care home managers to encourage staff to take up on the vaccine. And obviously, um, just picking up on what Toby says, we're, we're working hard to complete all the second vaccinations in care homes. And, and hopefully the second part of the capacity tracker went live on Friday. So we're now in the process now working with our care homes so that they upload their data. So we're actively ringing around now, encouraging them to complete that. And, and I think even once people have been vaccinated, I'd just like to take this opportunity um, to use um, Lucy's line just because you can doesn't mean you have to or something along the lines of that. But we still need to follow the guidelines. It's still really important that even where people have been vaccinated, that we take every opportunity to be safe, follow the guidelines. Um, we will gradually get there, but we just need to go very gently um, and stick to the rules. Um, and uh, as I say, just encourage everybody to continue to do that and to work in a safe fashion. Um, um, and that's why most of us are still remote most of the time, but still working hard uh, in order to keep everybody safe. Um, any other questions about um, the uh, the COVID response at the moment? Thank you. Um, so um, it's on another another Lucy item. So um, time for the public health report. Over to you, Lucy. Thank you, Chair. So this is quite a busy edition, so I make no apologies for that. Obviously, you'll see a lot of it is about us trying to get back to some of our business as usual, as I've just mentioned. Um, a couple of items I'd just like to bring people's um, attention to is, is one, the change to the Falls Prevention Service in Northamptonshire. So um, having had a number of conversations with partners um, around frailty and obviously programmes of work that are happening at a system level, what we've tried to do is refocus the Falls Prevention Service and, and really very much focus it more so on trying to um, intervene before people fall and or make sure that they're rehabilitated and the risk of further falls is reduced if they are indeed um, a victim of having had a fall. By doing this, we've just made a decision to bring the service in-house. So it now is hosted back in North Northamptonshire and it is very much aligned with the community adult social care work that's been happening. So all of the professional supervision now happens through the occupational therapists and physiotherapists that also work with adult social care. So there are going to be three main strands to the sort of refreshed service. One, we will always have that sort of immediate response after people fall and they've obviously gone back home to make sure that we identify any risks that might be within their setting or indeed to do with that person's behaviour or, or the way obviously that they're, um, how mobile they are and, and that will continue. But as I said, we're reinforcing the supporting independence element of this. So identifying potential risks for people who are mildly frail or who have a history of falling previously and then also putting more money and, and resource into the Otago strength and balance classes. So that really is about people maintaining their mobility, um, identifying risks that they may have either with declining mobility or within their household and obviously helping support them to remain independent within the community. Um, obviously, it still continues to dovetail with the work, as I said, with adult social care and also community um, nursing services. But um, we are just obviously trying to make sure that it does really focus much more on that preventative element of intervention as public health funding should. 
the only other thing, obviously, that, as I said, please do catch up with everything that's in the uh, update. But the only other thing I'd like to, to raise awareness of is that we're moving to a whole systems approach around weight management. It very much has previously been focused on providing a resource where people can attend if they want to lose weight, but they need to have already made that decision and want to engage with one of the programmes that we provided. We had recognised that not everybody liked the type of classes that were being offered. They were very traditional. And so we went back out and using the dynamic purchasing system of identified different types of provisions, such as Northampton Town Football Club um, and more online sessions where people aren't necessarily able to or, or wanting to attend a full class with other people in the room. So we've given a much broader range of um, support for people to lose weight. But as you can see from the update, we were also taking a much wider systems approach. So looking at how we can obviously use marketing and communication, how we're really offering this service across a life course, how we're going to be looking at active travel and how it links in with weight management, um, workplace support again, where people obviously do end up with quite negative habits, particularly around healthy eating and or the ability to physically exercise when they're working, but also really look, looking for the first time at food environments and access to healthy foods. So looking at drawing on people's social and corporate responsibilities around that within the system. So a really refreshing way to look at things. And we've given people obviously contact details there if they are interested in developing or contributing um, towards that agenda. Thank you. And, and I, I'd just like to, to make the point at this point, this is a particularly good point to start to talk about weight management. We know that COVID, from a COVID point of view, increased BMI is a significant risk factor. Um, and actually those people who have a BMI over 40 are eligible for vaccination purely on their BMI. So this is really a fantastic opportunity for people to optimise their health um, uh, in the context of knowing how devastating COVID has been. So this is, this is a really good time. Um, and as lockdown lifts, and people become more active and a little more normal in their lifestyles. This is a really good time for people to make a difference uh, with their lives. It's not all about health care. It's about actually making sure that people are healthy um, and uh, really, really good opportunity. Um, any questions about the public health report? OK, thank you very much, Lucy. Really, really appreciate all of the, the really useful information. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item 10, which is the NHS operational planning and contractions, a little little later than usual, uh, but still extremely valuable and still huge quantities of work. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Sarah for this item. Thank you, Chair. Um, so taking the paper, it's a short paper, but taking the paper is read, just a few things to pull out of this one in terms of operational planning guidance. Um, as you've already highlighted, this is later than normal. So we would normally be running a planning round December to February. Um, we are this year running a planning round of two halves, um, H1 and H2, um, and running to um, submission of draft plans for H1 on the 5th of May, 6th of May, sorry, and final plans on the 3rd of June. Um, although within that there are a number of other deadlines around elective recovery, around specifics about mental health and around finance, which Stuart will cover in his finance paper later on. Um, really, this paper just at a very high level summarises the priorities for the coming year. Um, and those are focused in six areas. They're around staff health and well-being. Um, continued delivery of services around COVID-19, including vaccination restoration and recovery, um, the expansion of access with a particular focus on primary care and health inequalities, um, looking at transforming services and particularly around the urgent emergency care pathways, but more broadly as well. Um, and the final one, which is a note, if you like, to the ICS work, which is working collaboratively across systems to do all of that. Um, just to brief uh, governing body on the process that we have set up. So we are leading the system planning process from the CCG as we did with phase three, um, engaged fully with system partners across the board, um, both from an activity workforce and finance point of view. We've got technical groups running, we've got narrative groups running, um, and we will be producing a draft for the May submission and a final submission for June. Um, I wasn't gonna add much more to that chair other than what's in the paper, but I'm happy to take questions on the content if there are any. Any questions or comments? Graham. 
Hi, uh, thanks for that, Sarah. It's a, a good, concise paper. Um, I was just wondering how we're responding to the sort of press reports on the massive build-up in electives. Um, it didn't seem a strong feature of the plan, but uh, clearly there's a, a big latent demand there. Yeah, um, so I'd say a couple of things. When we've got an elective, the system has an elective care board um, led by our group acute provider, um, but again, with representation across the system. Um, we're currently working through from a technical planning point of view, what we think capacity and demand looks like across the elective care pathway, um, and therefore what particularly in terms of both the recovery fund, but also the waiting list will look like over the rest of the year. Um, in terms of the specifics, um, Northamptonshire as a county, particularly from a 52 week point of view, doesn't have as big a problem as some of the rest of the Midlands in terms of numbers. Um, but we do have some specific areas that we need to work on. Um, so really, at this point in time, we're working through the technical detail and the elective care board holding on to the substance of that and also the extensive work that I would highlight we've done in our county with the independent sector over the past 12 months. Um, and the role that they can play in our recovery, which is liable to, which is likely to be significant in terms of um, that joint partnership working over the next 12 months. That's fine, thanks. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Bobby. Thanks, Chair. Um, Sarah, just interested in your take on in your kind of overview position, what field do you put in the kind of finance bit aside to one side for a minute? Because I know Stuart will come back to that later. But what from where you're sat at the moment feel like the biggest kind of challenge or risk areas in the work we're trying to draw together? Um, I think it's probably I fear pointing out the blind in the obvious with the answer to this question. Um, but it's probably, Toby, the multitude of various asks and trying to manage all of them. Um, but I think the one Graham's pulled out in terms of elective recovery versus a third wave, particularly. Um, so our acute providers still have particularly quite extensive theatre capacity dedicated to COVID response and therefore aren't yet stood up to full operating or elective capacity from the theatre's point of view. Um, they've both got a plan to write that within the next four to eight weeks and return to full theatre operating capacity. But I think the challenge against doing that against a potential third wave as we move later on into the year is significant. Um, I think the other thing is there are some things which uh, are different around this planning round. So the H1 versus H2 component as well, I think, produces a set of risks of its own, which we wouldn't normally face as part of a planning round. Um, and so it'd be those two things that I pull out, I think, specifically. Um, there, there are a number of others um, and we will highlight them as part of the narrative draft, which will undoubtedly bring back through governing body. Um, but they'd be the major ones for me at this point. Other colleagues might have others, though. So just for clarity, for those who may not be familiar with the terms H1 and H2, can you explain what those are? Sorry. Um, so we would normally have a we would normally have a year in quarters. Um, we now have a financial year largely defined in halves, um, so H1 and H2 for half one till September and H2 October to March, um, which are the split of the current contract and finance guidance. So we've been issued guidance currently that runs from April to September, now described chair as H1. Thank you. So I was just, just aware not everybody was was um, aware of those terms. Toby. I'm just going to follow back up on Sarah's answer there, which was helpful. Thank you for that, Sarah. Just to add on the elective side of things, I think you're right around the risk and the challenge there in terms of elective versus kind of COVID and potential what the rest of the year looks like. The other bit for me on the elective side of things that I'm picking up from regional and national conversations is there are still quite a few moving parts on the kind of elective expectations and to, to Graham's point about kind of national profile in, on this, you know, quite rightly, uh, this is absolutely at the top of the kind of priority list politically um, for the government in terms of how we recover elective wait time positions. So I think there's still two things that will play out a bit further here. One will be what does that look like in terms of a national policy position on expectation and is there a kind of more consistent standardised view we need to move towards? The second would be um, the region 
regional position, when you look at the Midlands, Sarah's right, we're actually, Northamptonshire, in a pretty reasonable place on this. That's not to say we don't have challenges, but particularly the work our two acutes did with the independent sector kept quite a bit of stuff still running. But other parts of our region are in a very different kind of place. And I think that's likely to take us into a conversation as we go forwards about balance of kind of wait time positions, not just in ICS areas and in county, but how do some areas potentially in the same way we saw critical care capacity supporting other areas within the region? Are we going to get into a bit more of that conversation in terms of more consistency across the area for, for populations on a bigger than county wide level? So I think for all those reasons, Sarah is absolutely right. That feels to me like the one which has got the most variable parts and the most challenge in it still, but also potentially still the furthest to go in terms of some of that framework. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Ali. Thank you. It's just a build on the elective conversations I haven't been embedded in it. If you take it back to the the risk we're actually sitting on in Northamptonshire, there is a clinical validation process continuously underway across all our providers working together. So we're trying to manage the risk that we are sitting on while we are planning for the future. There are two different components. The other message I want to give is that that is driving transformational work between different organisations and the changes that we have not been able to put in place for a long time and, a, and an energy behaviour behind it so it's it brings it down to some it is a difficult um and a risky component of our planning but in reality um we we are making headway and we've got to keep that momentum going the other point i'd make mental health capacity and demand and the demand in our mental health services and planning is also a major risk for us but i think we all recognize that thank you Thank you. And I think it's fair to say that there is a certain amount of unmet demand and we're all aware of patients who have put off um, uh, attending with a number of their, their issues. So there will be unmet demand out there as well as uh, 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 constriction on the some of the uh, capacity to, to deliver in the uh, traditional way. And I think Ali's absolutely right. This is an opportunity for transformation, particularly if we are to meet the unmet demand for both physical and mental health problems, uh, both of which are absolutely paramount for the uh, well-being of our population. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, uh, that's been a really helpful discussion. The next item is item 11, the new and improved and new format, uh, quality, performance quality highlight report. I believe Angie's going to start and then hand over to Sarah. We'll have a general discussion and at the end um, or, or somewhere along the way, we'll say what we think to the, uh, the new format as well. So over to you, Angie. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, obviously, colleagues will remember at the last governing body, we promised to bring back a new report and style, and, and this style we're hoping will also support the Integrated Quality and Performance Committee. So I really would welcome frank and honest feedback on this, because really what we want to do is escalate any actions, put mitigations in there as well. So I really would value any feedback today. So in terms of just highlighting some of the system issues, um, the trusts have seen a real demand in um, A&E and particularly on a Monday so that's something that we're looking in to see if there's something happening over the weekend which means that people are accessing A&E on a Monday. The trusts obviously are working as hard as they can using the same day emergency services that they can put in place um, to try and mitigate against that. I can actually give you some real positives now that staff shielding has stopped, the trusts have seen a real significant increase of staff coming back, which is great. And obviously they're putting systems in place to support those staff because some staff have been away from, from their normal roles for about 12 months. So they're putting the systems in place. But the good news is staff and numbers have come back up and the trusts are really seeing the benefits of that. As um, Sarah's already spoken about before about the elective care board, the system's focusing on um, restoring elective care. My team is still working with our providers to continually monitor any potential harms, especially around um, cancer breaches as well. So they're already in the report as well, Joe, to look at. One thing I did want to just highlight is I know I um, brought to the board attention last time was around St Matthews. 
So yesterday um, I chaired the Quality um, Improvement Board for St Matthews. I'm really pleased to say that the provider has engaged totally with this process. In fact, they've already commissioned an independent audit into their services which was presented, the findings were presented to the board yesterday. Now, there is work that needs to take place, but they're engaging with us. So what we have got is a quality improvement board and also an operational group, which my team will be working very closely with St Matthews to bring about those improvements, looking at the immediate, the short, the medium, the long term. So that was held yesterday. Also, all this week, St Matthews, have put in place a safeguarding um, convention. So it's very much focusing on safeguarding, quality, and they've put that in place every day this week so that staff can actually get real-time learning that they need to take on board, especially around SIs and stuff like that. So very positive, working with the local council and CQC and the provider. Joe, I'm going to stop there because I'm really mindful of time and I know Sarah might want to just talk about some of the performance aspect and then I really would value my colleagues' comments on if the report is easy on the eyes, easy to understand and if something they've found useful. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I don't have a massive amount to add to what Anne has said. I think she's covered the key issues within the report. Um, there aren't any significant or material movements to performance over the month before from over last time we met. Um, so I think the headlines remain as previously in terms of challenges, particularly from a discharge and flow point of view across the system, although eased slightly over the past couple of months are still a significant challenge. Um, and you can see the elective um, 52 week numbers in here, as we described in the previous item. Um, I think other than that, I'm happy to take questions, as I'm sure is Ange, on the content of the report, if anybody's got any. Any questions or comments? Alan. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I like the new format. I was just thinking of as we move towards an ICS, um, that there are other performance markers not captured in the report that may be helpful to start thinking about in terms of, you know, how different providers work together. I'm just thinking of, you know, the particular issue in the localities is around uh, district nurses and there's no real markers for district nursing, but things like that. Um, I don't know if that's been looked at in other system wide groups or not. Yeah. Jo, I'll just come back on that. Darren, we have we have been looking at that through the Primary Care Commissioning Committee. So, but do you know what, Darren, I would really welcome an opportunity outside the governor body to explore it in more depth with you, because really we want to get this right. And, you know, the first stab is never the perfect one, is it? So maybe outside the governor body, can I give you a, a ring and we can chat yeah. about it? Lovely. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Um, Toby. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just wanted to kind of share that as we go into um, May, we are expecting our kind of regulators, Energy England, to start putting back in some of the kind of performance oversight arrangements um, in relation to some of the core standard delivery areas. So uh, as people were, are aware, over much of the last year, the, the focus on quality, safety and harm has absolutely remained from a, a clinical point of view regionally and with areas. But we've had a number of our other arrangements like our routine quarterly review meetings step down in order to give space to teams to focus on pandemic response. Um, we're expecting to see those start to go back in again from May onwards. They'll be done on a system basis, which is very much where we got to previously, rather than being a sort of CCG and a provider trust specific thing. Um, but just worth noting uh, that those arrangements, and I think rightly that will bring some of the focus back again onto some of the kind of core standard delivery and constitutional delivery areas that are set out within the report as well. So you can see, feel that starting to shift rightly so as we move further through into this year. Um, I'll share Joe through our updates once we get further details of those kind of dates being scheduled in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lucy. 
Thank you. Um, and I think the format's really good. I think it's really easy to read. Um, I like the fact that you're, you're obviously doing reception re exception reporting, so just summarising what the key issues are. I guess my only question would be at the bottom, you've got that lovely three sections about the risks, actions and mitigations. Is just having some idea about a timeline where we might see some improvement because um, we don't yeah. always go back and check. And so yeah. having and sometimes we've got just got to recognize that sometimes our interventions will take sometimes six months to actually yeah. work through the data and or genuinely improve outcomes for patients. So I think there's something about managing system expectations. Um, it, it's something I raise every time, though, is we still don't have any insight into KGH's performance around A&E. And I recognise that's because they're part of a pilot. But we did talk yeah. previously about potentially getting some proxy measures so that we've got an understanding yeah. if the quality of access and access for patients is being impacted by them being part of that pilot so that that's my only reflection on on that oh one last thing um sorry we've just talked about the planning and obviously if there are going to be key areas that we do need to focus on do we need to think about how we factor those into our reporting around activity and quality going forward lovely thank you lucy I, I, all those three points fantastic um it's one of those things, isn't it? You're right. It's because we never really sometimes go back and audit, do we, in terms of that timeline? So I'll factor that in. In terms of the KGH, uh, I'll also look into that as well. Obviously, in the report I have put that we did, for example, do the mental health review about issues in A&E. Now, that report is with the provider and the next governor body. I will bring that back, but I will make sure I try and get something in the next report, Lucy, uh, and definitely about the planning as well. So lovely. Thank you so much. You. Bev. Yeah, ju just picking up on um, on Lucy's point, really, about the actions, risks, actions and mitigations. I and mean, when we've talked in in both the CCG and the system quality meetings, getting to a point of um, confidence about the reporting and a level of acceptance that we're reporting on the right things and it looks right and it feels right. And we've got some assurance around that. Obviously, having the risks identified and the mitigations, but you know what I'm anxious to get to is a level of maturity whereby we actually can deep dive into some of these risks and say, we said these were the mitigations. Have they actually delivered what they intended to deliver? Um, you know, we've we've all been around risk long enough to know that it's quite easy to identify mitigations sometimes. But as you say, it's the it's the discipline of the follow up of actually are those mitigations the right ones? Because you think they are when you write them and you plan for them, but sometimes when actually you do do a deep dive on some of the the critical lines actually there were other options you could have taken so I, I think I'm glad you're happy with it I'm certainly happy with it from the chair of the committee's point of view um, it will continue to evolve but we have also got plans to enhance it and do those deep dives once we've got some stability around the reporting and some alignment across the system and the CCG meetings yeah, uh, can I just pick back up that on that because in actual fact, Bev, we're just about to look at um, some of the children's services which have been asked from KGH as well. So, so we are starting to do that piece of work, Lucy. And I think, I think the governing body will be delighted with the new way of working. Um, I'm certainly pleased with the direction of travel and we're going down. Uh, and I'm just going to take the opportunity to say how much I like the format, the concept of the quality performance and, and the uh, the risks being on the same page, which I think is absolutely key and is how it affects our population. So I'm, I'm a big fan of the format. I think being able to track things, I think, is very useful from a time point of view. Um, but uh, from a personal point of view, really, really happy with the, with where we're going with the format. Um, Ali. Ange, can I just check back? So I, I really like the format, but I think it would be also really good that each of those selective areas are shared with the system groups. So it's the yeah. CCG's lens on it. Now, this is different to what Bev has described by the Integrated Performance yeah. Committee. Uh, rather than just going up, it needs to go back out because they need to own the mitigation. So I think now we've got something a lot more tangible that we can lift and shift and say, hey, elective care board, this is what's gone into governing body. Yeah. And I was just a lens on that and there are probably other things we could prioritize in there. and then you start to get cross system mm -hmm. focus on delivery together as well as assurance which is what we're um, undertaking here as a, a ccg governing body and my second point and i might have missed this apologies if i have is ockenden and maternity because that is a system risk for us yeah. and i'm just 
and that we're not missing anything while we're acknowledging some of the risks that are coming through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as, I mean, we have brought that already to the integrated committee and internally. I suppose you know the, we we are on top of it at the minute. But you're right, Alison. I mean, when we were writing the report, it wasn't a real being an issue at the time in terms of because we've brought that to the integrated committee. But I'll make sure that we we track that as well on the on the report. I'll pick up on both of those because I think the first point is very easy because we can decant them out very simply. You know, we can decant that really easily. Um, and I'll pick up on the second one as well, Alison. Thank you. Any other comments on quality performance so far? All I've heard is, is positive plus a few tweaks. Um, anybody else got any other comments um, to support the, the direction of travel that we're moving in? OK, thank you very much, everybody, for your comments. I, I'm sure um, Anja and Zoe will be happy to receive additional comments outside um, if, if you um, have not had a chance to mention those. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is item 12, which is the care home framework. So this is an agenda item for approval. Um, so I'm going to assume the paper's read. Uh, Ange, what else would you like to tell us? Um, Joe, I'd like to bring to the attention of the governing body. I'm absolutely delighted to bring the paper today because this has been a real journey for the CCG. We've been working on this project since November 2019, working really closely with our colleagues in local authority. And we've had a care homes framework delivery group. So the outputs have gone via CMT on several occasions. We've also took a paper to the Finance Committee on the 6th of April. So today I'm looking for approval on the next step of the journey where we take this to um, procurement. And I'm hoping to take this out to procurement on the 1st of May with um, if the governing body approves it today. So in essence, the paper is telling you what the status quo is now. So when we need to get a, a a nursing home and a bed for our for a patient who will then become a resident we do that on a spot purchase in Northamptonshire most areas work off a care home framework so what we're trying to do is bring that into Northamptonshire so within the paper you will see the project background and the milestones in terms of also the anticipated benefits for the quality outcomes. So the most important thing is we want to improve the resident experience. We want to make sure we can get sustainability for our care homes. So first of all, that the care homes know the price they can anticipate from the CCG. They know that from the local authority but from the ccg we've always done spot purchasing we want the care homes to be able to work with us around them receiving um training and education access to nhs mail um, also, we've been working with the council around what the service specifications will look like. So we're always going to be looking at quality through the same lens. So in the paper, it covers that. It also covers our engagement history. So we've been doing quite a lot of engagement with our care home providers. I personally have a dial in with care homes once a week and have done for a, for a year now. Um, so the care homes are looking for they're looking for direction from um, the system in terms of what they can expect. So within the paper also I've outlined future arrangements. When I took this paper to the Finance Committee, some of my colleagues were really helpful in saying, well, what about the next steps after that, you know, in terms of financial incentives? So, so Joe, in a nutshell, I'd really welcome some feedback from my colleagues. Um, just to say again, this is about improving the quality of care that residents receive in nursing homes. It's about us working very closely with our care home colleagues to help them to improve, to improve sustainability, and most importantly, to actually align ourselves with what the council are doing and also to eliminate any wasted time. Because every time we try and do brokerage, a spot placement, it's quite time consuming as well around negotiating on price and all that sort of thing. So I'm hoping the paper is quite self-explanatory, but very happy to have a, an open and frank conversation, Joe. And, and just to say again, it, it, this has been a very long project in the making. We kept engagement through COVID, you know, and we worked very closely with our colleagues in the council. For example, the weekly dial-ins, the newsletters, everything else. This all paints a picture of what we're trying to do, which is obviously to support our care homes to improve the care they offer to our residents. 
Thank you. And, and I think another example of looking at a uh, potentially vulnerable group in our population and making sure that we're trying to do the very best thing for that population. Uh, Sam? Um, I just wanted to provide a bit of extra assurance. So this paper did come to Finance Committee and I think we challenged it quite intensely, actually. <laughs> and um, and did a really, really good job. And I think a lot of work has been done in this, in this space. And actually, it is a really, really positive step forward given everything else that's happening in the CCG at the moment. So I just wanted to provide the assurance around all the work and all the detail is absolutely behind this paper. Um, and we were really, really comfortable in approving it in the Finance Committee. Thank you. Uh, Toby. Thanks, Joe. Um, in a similar vein to Sam's comment, CMT, corporate management team, likewise, has had various loops through this really important topic over months rather than just kind of over weeks. So I'm very conscious there is a lot more detail that rightly sits outside of the paper that's here in board um, that I'm grateful that committees and other places have had a chance to kind of work through en route to here. Um, I guess I, and so you know, I'm fully supportive of this. I think this is a, a really necessary and essential first step or next step. But I say next step because as the paper points to the real kind of direction we want to move to here for Northamptonshire is a much, much closer alignment between NHS and local government um, commissioning and funding of services linked into residential care. And that's something which we've made some really good steps and Angie's team have been working really closely with the two new DAS directors um, adult services within um, our two new unitary councils. I know both local authorities are very much committed to that direction as well. There are various practical challenges in moving through that, not least the differences between um, universal access um, and means tested and also the differences between kind of the starting funding rates, particularly coming into this for the two different parts of the system. But this will help us over time converge further in that direction. And that's another reason for me, whilst I would have loved, as you know, Alan, to have seen us taking another bigger step than this. I recognise the practical challenges that creates in bringing together sets of arrangements that are quite different. So I think this is a good move forwards and it gives us the right direction to carry on building, particularly as we go forward as an ICS working with the two unit trees. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? So um, um, I, we are being asked to, as governing body, to approve the commencement of the procurement process for the care home framework um, as described. Um, you know what you need to do. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are voting members, um, if you could put uh, the item on the agenda, which I'm going to remind you, just go back to my agenda. Um, so this is item 12. Um, and if you approve, if you could pop that into the chat um, as a record of your decision, that would be really helpful. And Sam won the competition. Not that there's a competition and not that we're competitive in any way. <laughs> but she did win. <laughs> OK, thank you, everybody. That's fine. So we, we have enough votes there um, in order to approve that paper. So thank you very much. Re really happy to see the, the direction of travel. Um, so the next item on the agenda, and you seem to have a lot of papers this month, um, uh, which is, is is important because it means we're focusing on, on, on the quality of people's care, but you do seem to have a lot of, a lot of papers. Do. So the next one on the agenda is item 13. Um, so end of life care following on logically from from those who are older and frailer, yeah. it's logical to look at the end of their lives as well. So again, I'm going to take that paper. Okay. This is another paper of approval. If you could tell us what we need to know, please. Yeah, well, basically this paper's already been through the procurement delivery group in March. It's also been to the finance committee in April. Just want to say we have no quality concerns with um, Marie Curie. They're delivering a really good service. What I would say is what I'm asking for is approval to extend the contract for a further 12 months. What we would like to do in that period of time, in the, in the first six months, is look at the service specifications, look at what we really need in Northamptonshire around um, services for end of life, 
also joe just to bring to the attention it's not in the paper but just so that everyone knows that the new end of life delivery group has met we met two weeks ago um and it was a really good meeting we've got lots of new people on that delivery group for example we had the ambulance service being involved so we are taking a real system look at end of life services so i'm just asking the governor body today for approval to extend this contract just to give assurance that what we will be doing now is looking at our service provision for end of life using the last year's of delivery group looking at everything we've got within northamptonshire to make sure we've got the right services for our patients and our residents in northamptonshire joe so i'm looking for approval it has already gone to finance and the Pro Pro procurement delivery group so i'm bringing it here today for approval thank you any questions or queries before we get to the the voting bit anybody else that wants to comment on this uh, and certainly i think you know making sure that people have a good end of life is something that is um, so important and having the right teams around uh, to support families particularly at these difficult times um, is something that i know that, that our population really really values a any comments questions queries I think I think the paper is is very straightforward, uh, well explained, um, and so I think the the next item that we need to do is to put item thirteen. And if you approve that, um, Sam has won again. Um, and if you would like to put that while we're voting, Bev, did you want to comment? Only to say that um, I can't vote. It's saying I'm not part of the chat, <laughs> so that's the reason I'm not voting. <laughs> Excuse accepted. If there were an item where we did not have enough, uh, then we would be able to accept a uh, a verbal vote on that one. But I think we have plenty to uh, carry that item. So I think we're OK. But uh, yes, we need to look at that. It may be what you've uh, the email address that you've logged in under. Uh, some some are more difficult to to vote with than others. Thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda is item 14, uh, which is the CCG Future uh, Corporate Working Arrangements. Um, so this is um, a, an item again for approval um, and I'm going to hand over to you, Stuart. Thanks, Chair. Again, I'll, I'll assume the oh, strange thing is appearing. The paper is, is red, but I'll bring up the highlights. This is red, obviously been in discussions with the yourself chair, the lay members, and through the exec committee. It's showing us reinstating the committees and what the frequencies of the committees, which you can see in table one, and re-establishing the governing body assurance framework live from uh, first I don't step. think you're Good. actually showing table one. I believe you're showing just your screen with teams on. Who who's um doing the um the tech? Joe, I think it's Bev's screen that's sharing, looking at what's coming up on my screen. I think Bev might be inadvertently yeah. doing a screen share. Share anything. <laughs> it could be worse. It could be much worse. Yeah, that was fine. I think I'm going to go out and come back in again. <laughs> no, please stay. Please stay. OK, back to you, Stuart. So, so what we're looking to is for the, the, in essence, for the government body to approve the establishment of the committees at the frequencies as in table one in the report and bring back the GBAF or governing body assurance framework from May the 1st. Any comments, queries, thoughts, anything anybody wants to share at this point? Um, so there are three, there are, sorry, there are two elements to this. One is, oh, Toby, over to you. Sorry, Joe, just wanted to chip in to say that I, I think this is helpful in terms of the kind of arrangements and what's set out. It also is particularly helpful because as we and we'll talk later and we go into kind of the comp part of today's meeting around ICS journey and timescales. But I think it's likely as we progress further through this year and we start to step up sort of shadow form ICS arrangements, probably more from quarter two as we go through the year, um, that this gives us some of the ability to be able to lean one into the other. We're going to need to be really careful, as Stuart rightly knows and Neil, to make sure that from a corporate governance point of view, whilst our statutory functions don't change, that we've got those things appropriately covered off. But I do think this is pointing to something that we will be needing to do more of as we go further through the year 
in terms of as we start to sort of flex some elements down and step some of those shadow arrangements up, particularly from Q2 and the sort of second half, that kind of H2 part of the year, I suppose, from September, October onwards. Just a bit of a marker, Joe. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's very much about looking to uh, a slightly different way of working within the system while keeping ourselves uh, safe and legal as we do that. So there are two elements within this. One is we're asked to approve uh, the recommended committee frequency as set out, but also to note uh, the formal reinstatement of the, uh, the GBAF. Um, really important, particularly as we um, go into this next transition phase, uh, uh, phase that we uh, note that. Uh, but the item that we are being asked to vote on um, is to uh, ask to vote on the, the suggested reinstatement of the committee um, as laid out. So this is item 14. Uh, so you know what you need to do. If you're happy to approve this, if you could pop it in the chat with the number 14. I think Sam may be going for a clean sweep on the speed of approval. <laughs> like I said, not a competition. <laughs> Thank you. So um, that item is approved. Um, so the next item on the agenda, appropriately given that we've just noted the reinstatement of the GBAF, um, is an item on risk management, um, and that is a verbal item. Um, so over to you, Stuart. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. This one we keep there, just in case people want to highlight risks while the GBAF was still going the wood. But I think we've already had those discussions earlier on, the risks around the system, so nothing further to add at this point. Thank you. Short and sweet. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the Northamptonshire CCG uh, Constitution. Um, and this again is an item for approval. Um, Stuart, is there anything you particularly want to mention to us at this point in particular? The uh, why has it come back to governing body? <laughs> <laughs> well, in particular, because in essence, it's come back for approval in reality, because in rea we've got a practice that has merged and we've got the disestablishment of the local authorities and the creation of the two local authorities. So it's just here for that, in essence. So a simple one, I would suggest. So for, for those who obviously everybody has read it in enormous detail and, and reads it on a regular basis, but for those who have not, uh, it's important to note the reasons. And obviously those are material changes. It does need to be rewritten when, when those changes happen. Um, and that is the reason that it has come back to, um, to a governing body. Sam's got in ahead of time. Um, OK, if you're happy with it, then if you could approve that, that would be really helpful. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda um, is item 17. Um, so um, I'm going to hand over to Lucy in a moment. The, this is on the agenda for the assurance of the process. Governing body will have received the paper. Um, I'm sure Lucy's going to talk uh, through it in more detail, um, the, um, but the, the details of the draft account are, are not on our website at this point. So Lucy, over to you. Thank you, Chair. So, as always, we are required as a CCG to provide an annual report. Um, this year, obviously, will be the first time that we do pr produce one as one single CCG. So it's an exciting time and we've taken that opportunity to refresh the look of it. Um, obviously, it is a statutory requirement. Um, the first draft is due to be submitted a week today and the final draft will be submitted on the 15th of June. I'm sure people will remember from previous years, um, a lot of the data uh, that we are required to include actually obviously requires us to finish our final end of year accounts and things like that before we can obviously complete that final draft. And that obviously is reflected as well in the fact that the final draft isn't required until June. So really what we're asking governing body to do at this point is note the progress made and members of governing body will have seen a draft be circulated um, separately. So note the progress made on the draft and the 
really sort of refreshed uh, approach. We try to make sure it's more accessible to the public. So the front end is sort of loaded more with information about what we've been doing, what we're going to be doing over the next year, the impact, for example, this year of COVID on our operational delivery and activity, et cetera. And then the latter sections are more of that kind of constitutional and statutory requirement around the detail of finances, et cetera. Um, the performance tables and financial tables, as I said, do tend to um, need to be completed at a later date. So uh, the timetable that is set out in the paper shows you the process that we go through. So people receiving a draft, but also having presented that to risk and audit. Um, then the completion of the outstanding information and the recirculation of that final draft with the final accounts. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions or if Stuart wants to add his bit about the accounts, then, then obviously, um, again, we could collectively take questions. So I think we'll, we'll take Stuart's bit next and then any questions um, after that. Stuart, over to you. Yep, I'm sorry, just to add Lucy, but the plan is that obviously the national deadline is the 27th of this month to submit the, the draft accounts. We are currently working on, on that. I'll be reviewing it personally on Friday and we'll hope to submit on Monday a day early because we like to submit a day early for assurance purposes. So just in case there's an IT issue. So in case insurance, but it, at that point it is only draft, at which point it then goes to auditors and obviously for discussions at governing body, audit committee, finance committee, through that process. So I'll just stop that and take any questions. I'm going to ask just one question. Obviously, as people look through, there will be some feedback. Um, who is collating the feedback? Because I think it's really important for governing body to look through this and, and to give feedback. We would really welcome people's comments. Um, who's, who's collating that, Lucy? Absolutely, would welcome all comments. As I said, this is the first time we've done it as a single report. And as I said, we've also um, tried to refresh the, the feel and the look of it uh, to reflect our new branding. So if it's to do with content and format, then it's Hannah Crookshank, who's the comms lead um, within the CCG. If it's around finance or figures, then it's it's Stuart's team. <laughs> there you go. You, you, you know, send it to Toby. Thanks, Joe. Um, just a quick comment on feedback. I really, whilst obviously Lucy and Stuart have both pointed to the April draft and then June final, um, I'm sure we'd be all keen to make sure the April draft is as um, draft final a draft as it can be, noting that quite a few of the numbers in particular, both finance and performance, have to be dropped in as we get nearer to that time. But I'd be really keen, I'm sure you would be as well, Chair, for us to make sure that we've got the rest of the content of this um, as much there, there or thereabouts as we can do in that time scale. So if people are are able over the next couple of days if they haven't already had a chance to look through the drafts that I know have been shared in full really would ask and encourage people to provide any feedback back into Hannah on those so we can get those elements as straight as we can at this point thank you thank you Lucy just to add one thing, so absolutely um, agree that we need to try and get this as, as final a draft as possible by the April submission. Um, it's just worth noting that because we're trying to source things like local photos rather than general photo stock photos, and also we're, um, we're investing in some the development of some infographics so that we've got, you know, as I said, some of our information that can be quite complex laid out in a way that people find more accessible. Um, some of those things obviously are still being developed, so, you know, we will add those as soon as we possibly can and make sure people get sight of those. Thank you. Graham. Uh, yeah, just uh, appreciation of the process. Uh, as Lucy said, it went to the Risk and Audit Committee. There was a couple of comments that have been taken up, uh, but uh, I think it's coming together very professionally and very well. Um, the finance sign offs and things are all in place, so uh, uh, should should be uh, well managed. Um, you do occasionally get some funnies in these finance tables. So as, as others have said, it's well worth having a proper look at it and everybody check their own details as well as the generic uh, part of the uh, report and accounts. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for the assurance on the process. Obviously, we all look forward to hearing it. Hopefully we will have um, a, a slightly more conventional AGM format this year, but um, who knows? Uh, we will we will certainly make sure that uh, the public are aware of it. Thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda is item 18, which is the uh, finance report. Uh, so this is another Stuart item. Thank you, Chair. I'll make this brief because I assume the paper is read again. This is reported on month 11 where we 
had an in-year position of an underspend of, excuse me, of 293k. Noting in month M, we had our historical surpluses from the CCGs at the time returned to us, which then made us, in essence, pro rata it, in essence, 23 million returned, but they are historical accumulated deficits, not for use. You have to draw them down if required. So, but there are given update, uh, the CG is expecting to have approximately half a million underspend on audited accounts at year end, which is obviously a, a good tight position, I would say, because that's 0.04% of the, the allocations. So a good position, because we're not meant to make huge surpluses in reality. And that was the plan, and we helped out the system, as you can see from the report, to make the system should be saying and balanced at year end as well. I'll stop that point. Take any questions? Any questions? Stunned silence. Everybody happy? Um, Toby. Yeah. It would be wrong not to ask Stuart to convey board's thanks, I think, to the finance team and function for the year end process and drawing this together. Um, I think this year, not I think, without a shadow of a doubt, this year has been the most financially complex year in terms of number of moving parts that I can recall in my NHS career. And whilst the challenge, therefore, because let's be honest, the NHS has been rightly, um, appropriately and generously funded as we've gone through the last 12 months. Um, but that's not made the financial kind of challenge any more straightforward in terms of the complexity of the number of things that have been moving, the number of non-recurrent things that have dropped into the system to support. And as Stuart knows only too well, the number of things that for all understandable reasons have carried on changing and evolving all the way through um, the process as we've gone through this. So I just wanted to put on my record for particularly at this kind of moment, um, the work that the team had done to draw that together. Clearly, I shall reserve um, judgment on final thanks until we get the audited position, um, but I have every confidence in the team because of the track record of them in managing the way through that process. So um, thanks, folks. Thank you, Toby. Um, so I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Stuart, for that much appreciated. I believe yours is also the next item on the um, agenda. Um, this is the little Stuart section. So this is the financial planning update. Again, a uh, a peculiar year in so many ways. Um, tell yeah. us, tell us what else we need to know. Um, again, I'll assume the paper is read. It, this adds to what Sarah briefly said earlier about H1, H2. What I would say for for note to everybody, the system and the finance group are working not just on H1, but are working on H2 and the next couple of years. We are producing a strategy for, for the next over the next three years at this moment in time. So we need to take some assurance of that we are in discussions with the regulators as well on a regular occurrence. Fortunately, at the moment on these plans, long before the submission on the 6th of May for the first draft. And obviously we're, we're then reporting into Chief Exec's Finance Committee so there's quite a lot going on on this at this moment and as Toby correctly I like we've normally finished this by this time of the year but we're in the middle of it at the same time and some allocations were only notified as of last week so it's still a it's still a moving feat and I'll stop that point take any Thank questions you. any questions for Stuart So um, thank you for that. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, Toby. Sorry, Joe, to, uh, the, the Stuart and Toby conversation at the moment for the last couple of items, but I, I didn't want us to move off of this item without acknowledging that um, actually in contrast to the kind of feedback about the year we just had around financial position, I think particularly the second half of the financial year that we are now in, um, the kind of H2 descriptor in terms of half two, is going to be a really different place for us as a system as we go forward financially and you know rightly those conversations as Stuart said have been worked through in a really constructive way these days across our finance community a very open way um, and sharing the kind of challenges in that but I know from regional conversations and national conversations 
um, that we are kind of a county that's got some really significant underlying positions here that we're going to need to work through over the next period. So I just want a board to be kind of cited that this is going to be something I think probably almost less so the age the first half of the year because of the continued different arrangements contractually and also financial allocation side of things for providers. But the second half of the year where we're still expecting a return to much more um, normal, if I call it that kind of financial and payment mechanisms and contracting mechanisms, I think is going to take us as a county into really different kind of territory. So we are going to need to find a way to put more space and time into some of our agendas. I'd suggest, Joe, probably through one of our informal thinking time sessions in the first instance, just so we can start to kind of get a common base level of understanding of what that good work that Stuart and folk are doing uh, and described is telling us. But what it will tell us is that we've got a real challenge in the second half of the year in particular that's going to need some quite tough, I think, choices and, and balances to be made between kind of cost base delivery and overall financial position. So sorry to be a bit of a kind of bring the mood down from much of today's conversation, but um, I think it's right that we acknowledge that at this point on the agenda. Thanks, Joe. Thank um, any final comments, Stuart, um, on, on your item? No, okay. thank you, Chair. No, no problem. Um, so the next item on the agenda is item 20, that is the contracting and, and procurement report, and that has Sarah's next to it. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, I'm not going to say a huge amount about this paper. I take it the content as read, um, same format as previous months. Um, the contracting guidance is reiterated in here in terms of um, what happens in this year's planning round. Um, I think a challenge for the team currently to try to work through what arrangements we can put in place to start proactively thinking about the requirements for H2 um, in terms of currently we understand the guidance to be that we will need to put normal, if you like, contracts back in place for the second half of the year. Um, so some fairly extensive work will be required in terms of the contracting round that supports H2. Um, other than that, you, the issues within the paper are very similar to those from the previous months. There's a highlight report at the end just in terms of current procurement activity, a number of which you've actually had the approvals for in the earlier part of the meeting. Um, so I will stop there take, and take questions if anybody has any. Any questions or comments on the procurement report? No, you have you have stunned silence. Um, so I think uh, from from that point of view, I think everybody is happy. I think it's also worth noting that there is a huge amount of activity going on. Um, you know, it is at every single area that is working really, really hard and really grateful for the people who've been um, involved in this area um, as well. So um, that is a paper that was presented for assurance rather than, than for approval. Um, so the final paper that we have on the agenda for this part of the meeting um, is item 21, which is the primary care report. Um, so if I could hand over to you, Julie, um, obviously people have read the paper. Tell us what else uh, we need to know. Thank you, Joe. Um, so what I would like to just try and just draw out of um, the paper um, is that the majority of this is really good news. Um, so, you know, around the mass vaccinations, about the digital technology that is now available and that has been funded and is being used in general practice, which is fantastic. And um, the pulse oximeter rollout and the virtual wards within the two hospitals um, and, the, and that is digital technology as well that's um, delivering on that. And then things like workforce where we've got a new practice manager um, development program, which I'm um, very pleased to say. But I just wanted to just pull out a little bit more around the health and social care integration part um, and going back to, you know, our NHS um, operating plan um, and actually, you know, section E or priority E um, around community and urgent and emergency care um, integration. Um, so within the next six months, um, we will have on a PCN um, footprint, um, a lot of things will be happening and are already happening. Yeah. There is great momentum um, and there is great enthusiasm um, around being able to have clinical leadership for each of the PCNs, project management support within each of the PCNs, but also 
Um, there are going, there's going to be welfare support, which is going to be delivered through adult social care, NHFT, and the voluntary sector. And also we have access to, or they will have access to befriending services. There will be befriending coordinators um, within the county that will be able to do that the accessing. We're, we're, we're doing a proof of concept around a volunteer passport, which I'm very excited about, again, based on um, a, t a technological um, uh, tool, um, which will be fantastic. And of course, we've got the Ardens templates. So those Ardens templates now that are being rolled out over in, in general practice, um, which is for consistent recording of care plans and care planning. And we know that then by within the next six months, so all of this is going to happen in the next six months, um, but we will also have the community sites, so our NHFT community sites and the frailty clinics within NGH and KGH, the, uh, their um, emergency end, will also have access to the Arden's templates. So we will then have one single care plan across all those areas that our frail elderly people um, may very well um, touch and they will be able to read, the clinicians will be able to read what's on the plan and this will be I think an absolute game changer around how we actually care for people in the community and very much supports the delivery of, of that priority E uh, in, our, in, the, in the national planning framework. Um, I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Julie? Ange? Yeah, um, Julie, thank you. I, I thought that was a great report. So much positive stuff in there. Um, I just wanted to add in terms of the integration, Julie, we've um, the practice nurses, we've got 16 places, haven't we, for the Royal College of Nurses and IPC course, but those nurses will be on the programme with another 10 nurses from social care. And I think that's really important, isn't it, Julie, because we're trying to get that integration between care homes and primary care because practice nurses have a close working relationship with care homes. So I think that's really positive as well, Julie, isn't it, that we've managed to get that cohort just for Northamptonshire and they start in May. So yes. that's really positive in terms of integration. I just wanted to finish on that little bit of positivity. Thank you. And, and I think there is a lot of positivity, equally a, a huge amount of hard work, and we appreciate the huge amount of demand that is within the system um, as well. So I think um, uh, in the spirit of, of many of the things that we've said, you know, thanking our, our colleagues across primary care in its widest sense for, for working and for making these initiatives a reality for the population um, that we serve. Any other comments on the primary care paper? OK, thank you. So um, I think the, the last item that we have is for me to um, uh, sum up the, the key messages from the meeting today. I think that one of the key messages is to note um, the, um, uh, the, the positive picture from the point of view of reducing uh, COVID rates and increasing vaccinations uh, and how important that is. Um, I think that it's also um, important that we've started to have those conversations about the elective care while accepting the challenge of supporting those people who are waiting for operations. I'm delighted that we've approved the care home framework for the, the CHC nursing care um, and I think this is an example of health and care system working and engaging together to look at the needs of staff residents in a timely way. Um, that we've approved the end of life contract extension and that we note the challenges of finances and planning in the coming year um, and our gratitude for everybody who's working so hard uh, to achieve this across the system. So those are, are my final comments. Um, thank you very much everybody for your attention. Thank you for voting. Thank you for those of you who entered into the voting competition. Um, um, I'm going to bring the meeting to a close at this point. Um, you get um, 12 minutes for those of you who are joining the next meeting. Um, if you could join us at um, uh, five past three, um, you've got 12 minutes for whatever you require to do during that time. See you in 12 minutes. Thanks, Jay. See you then.